So we are going to go ahead and begin. I'm Michelle Gahey, and I work on the innovation team at CoGenerate, coordinating fellowships and programs across the organization. So I am so excited, excited today to introduce our host um, of today's 3Gen webinar on mental wellness, Serena Beyond. And I wanna take a moment to just give you a little bit of an introduction to our host, Serena. And she has such an amazing CV that we could spend all of our time just on that. But here's a few highlights. And also Duncan will drop a full bio in the chat um, so you can have more information. But Serena, currently she serves as a special advisor as a special advisor for the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. And one of her areas of specialty is bringing a spiritual understanding to the public health crisis of loneliness and disconnection. Um, Serena is also a chaplain in training and she's examining systems that isolate communities from themselves and one another. Um, and she is also, one more thing, an Encore Public Voices Fellow and a current Co-Generate board member. So it's really my pleasure to welcome Serena Beyond. Thank you so much, Michelle and, and Duncan and the entire CoGenerate team. And I'm just so grateful to be here today, grateful to be in this conversation um, to learn together, which I am most excited about and feel that others on this call may be too. I feel like this is such an amazing opportunity to continue to create the conditions for more collaborations using and within this co-generation ecosystem. So just really excited to get to nerd out and have a multi-generational conversation today. Um, just very briefly, one of the central questions that we ask at the Office of the Surgeon General and with Dr. Murthy regarding our country's need for addressing the crisis of mental health and loneliness, and on the flip side of that, you know, community connection, mental wellness, is what kinds of infrastructure of care are required or do we need to build for across all generations um, and communities so that we can be good hosts to one another, hosts of friendship, of care, of compassion, and how do we actually operationalize that, which is why I'm so excited to be in this conversation with Lewis and Raquel today, who both in their own ways have been living into that question to um, creating structures to answer that question in such innovative and um, graceful ways. So in this conversation today, we'll, we'll definitely dive into the tactics, the methods, getting into you know, what's challenging about this, as well as the story sharing. Um, each of them has invited participants of their programs to also take some time to share personally and hear directly from them about you know, how this model works and, and what is possible. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention is we'll spend the first um, 15 or so minutes in conversation with Lewis and Raquel, and then we'll break it up for them to bring in some program participants and finally end with some of your questions. So please feel free to continue dropping that in the chat and, and we'll hope to answer them. So let's just jump into the conversation. I would love to introduce um, the both of my co-panelists today. Firstly, Lewis Bernstein, who is the president of Lewis J. Bernstein and Associates, a company that he founded after retiring as an executive vice president at Sesame Workshop, which I find really cool, <laughs> given that I feel many of us on this call grew up with Sesame Street. Lewis is a co-founder of Swan 3G Mentoring, which is an amazing mental wellness initiative in which older adults mentor high school students who then are empowered to mentor preschoolers. So it's such an incredible three-generational model. With the use of brief and carefully selected Sesame Street segments to spark joy and discussion, his program builds multi-generational relationships, empathy, and communication skills. And Lewis is also a co-generate innovation fellow. So welcome, Lewis. Thank you very awesome. much. 
<laughs> we also have Raquel Padilla, who brings foster grandparents and Cal State Fresno college students together to teach emotional literacy to young kids and, and teens ages 7 to 20 in both after school programs, in a charter school, as well as a foster care agency. So amazing to see the breadth and depth of where this program is living already. Raquel is a very special or the special volunteer specialist with Fresno Economic Opportunity Commission's Foster Grandparent Program. And she is currently fulfilling her purpose as a generation serving together fellow by creating meaningful connections with her peers and her community. And Raquel has a bachelor's degree in social work. So welcome to the both of you. And I have a starting question for the both of you, which is what draws you both to this work personally? And also what caused you and your organization to see addressing mental wellness as essential? So what drew you to this work? And also what drew your organization and your work to seeing mental wellness as essential? And um, maybe Raquel will begin with you and then Lewis can, can tag on. Thank you so much, Serena. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so what drew me to um, to start a mental wellness program was sort of the disconnect that we had, especially during COVID of social isolation. Um, people are grieving. They don't know where to go. Um, it was our the biggest impact that we had um, with COVID. It, it completely took everything away from us. And I seen my senior volunteers experience that um, on hand, you know, they, they're losing people they they can't grieve the pro properly. And it's, it opened my eyes to reconnecting with my seniors, with young adults, with the community, um, connecting not only with our peers, but ourselves as well, to be able to open that up to each other and to provide that mental wellness to the younger ones as well, who also suffered from COVID, the virtual learning, a complete disconnect to school. And um, this is this is this program focuses on that, on reconnecting each other, reconnecting in three different generations with the older adults, the mid adults and the young adults and the children. Um, so that that was my that is what drove it, drove me to do that. Um, so for me, it was very personal. I retired from the workshop after 43 years, uh, which it took me to graduate preschool, 43 years in preschool. But then I finally graduated. And when I graduated, I felt unmoored. I, I, I felt that this great sense of meaning that was part of the work at Sesame Street was missing in my life. And I knew there were others who also felt the same way. And so together with other alumni, Ira and a couple of other people, we said, why don't we think about how we can give from our experience uh, forward? And as we thought about it, we looked at the issues that were really affecting America in general and knew that no one institution could deal with it. We thought as a voluntary group, maybe we could somehow using these incredibly wonderful, joyous segments that all have education or curricula, use it as a spark for discussion with both teens and for them with preschoolers. And so that we could create this virtuous three generational circle of, of communication and relationship building, knowing full well we would not solve the problems of the country, but that we could create a pilot that we could use to experiment with. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. And to this point of this being a pilot model and, and the three generation as opposed to the tr more traditional two generational approach, I'd love to hear from the both of you. And maybe Lewis, you can get us started to share a little bit more about why three generations and you know, how does your model work? What are the mechanics of that? Well, uh, I'm looking at on the top of the screen, Ira and Joe, who will be talking to you later. Um, one of the things that we realized is that if we as uh, seniors were talking to students alone, that would be very powerful. And they, we could listen to each other, we could share with each other. But we thought that one of the really important things would be to empower uh, young students to pay it forward. And so that we could 
pull together the past in the seniors, present in the teens, but the teens could help build the future with preschoolers. And we knew that preschoolers were suffering too from being removed from school, from being removed from each other. And to have a teen who could focus on them exclusively and give to them and become their first uh, maybe adult friend outside of relatives and the classroom, we thought would be powerful. And so that was why we said, let's pay it forward and add a third generation. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Lewis, I actually like that you bring that up because working with three generations, which I have here, um, <laughs> my volunteers, we we're having some difficulties with technology, but it's like a three in one, right? You get with the older generation, you get the, you get the wisdom out of it. Um, mm -hmm. Mid generation, young generation, you get the personal experience, you know, they've gone through that. They've, um, they're still probably healing from that. Um, from any personal life experience that they've had challenges with. Um, and with the younger generation, they're going through it, right? And all that in one just is, is, is just a really good, I'm sorry, I'm stuttering a little bit, but it's just the perfect team, if I would say, you know, that everyone is coming in with their experience, the benefits of creating a team together, um, working off of each other, um, peer to peer, learning from each other, um, and everyone being able to understand each other as well, and to be able to work on um, any mental health struggles that they are dealing with. And that's all in three in one, really. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to your last point of, especially those who might be struggling with mental health challenges, I'm curious for the both of you, you know, how have you seen this co-generational approach uh, address and support mental well wellness um, across various generations? Lewis, we'll begin with you. Okay. Okay. Um... So, you know, when we first planned this, we did not think of this as a mental health initiative. We thought of it very much as trying to support emotional well being and trying to support the sense of growth, empowerment, a growth mindset, and to somehow address for seniors like me the sense of will we find meaning? And will we see a little bit of hope in talking to these wonderful teens that we really didn't have about them? We didn't know them. So we were really beginning to just open up and experiment, knowing that long-term, building connections, building relationships, helping with empowerment, dealing with a growth mindset, and helping young preschoolers be reintroduced to curriculum through this joyous segment was a way to begin to build a foundation towards it. Um, so I, I think that's the way we looked at it. And I think what was interesting for us when we spoke to the teens, like Joe, uh, when we said, why are you coming back after they did an initial pilot? Why do you wanna do a second pilot? They said, well, you know, we hardly ever talk to adults let alone our parents. And we were learning to do that. And we hardly ever communicate on email. And we were we kind of had to do that with you. And so there were skills they were beginning to develop and feel. And we felt that this project was a way to do it in a very painless way without uh, uh, any kind of uh, judgment. But it was just a, a sense of almost uh, a three-way romance between a preschooler, a teen, and a senior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful, Lewis. Thank you. <laughs> um, so for me, it was sort of, I had a more personal relationship to Brene Brown. Um, and when I read her book, Atlas of the Heart, um, it was cultivating meaningful connections with others. Um, and also based off of her 87 emotions um, on places we go where we feel this, right? And um, when I, it it was part of my life already pretty much. I'm practicing these, these skill sets to connect with my coworkers, with my supervisor, with um, other coworkers around me, other people in the community. And I just, and when this opportunity came up, I just thought to myself, like, let me just try it out. Let me see how this would work and how I how we can cultivate meaningful connections as a team with two different generations and how we can bring meaningful connections to the youth and children. And so far it's 
it's been wonderful. It's the vulnerability that we see um, every Friday at our team meetings, um, people who share their experiences and who have the courage to show up as themselves. It's been, they've been able to open up themselves and um, bring a passion to each other to work um, on these lesson plans for those who are in need of mental wellness to provide emotional literacy, um, knowing what exact feelings they are feeling at the time and being able to cope with them and being able to identify them as well. Absolutely. I'm just feeling also the, the invitation to be most human with one another from an emotions perspective, from all the content that comes through and the lessons of, of Sesame Street. It's like the art of humaning that, that you both are really engaged in. Um, I wanted to just uh, ask one more question, one or two more questions before we transition into Raquel, um, turning it over to you and, and your program participants who are right next to you. Um, and, and it's really to get at the stigma that, you know, we still live in, in our culture around mental health, you know, that is still very real and still very prevalent. And, you know, I would imagine across programs that you're both engaged in, there might be a tension in designing programs like this, given the existing stigma that, that we hold. Um, so I was curious if either of you wanted to speak to how programming can be somewhat of a backdoor approach to building mental well-being um, if there is, you know, the, the um, presence of, of the stigma or how you both through your programs kind of deal with that and dance with, with that. I can go first if you'd like. I've avoided it, not intentionally, up until now. And I think as we've developed, we've only really become aware of how important what we're doing can be to mental wellness. And I think, you know, one of the things uh, I wonder when I asked Joe to speak, did he understand that this was also about when mental wellness? Because we were not all that clear about it. I think we're much clearer about it as we progress into the future with our uh, new pilots and what we're going to do uh, further. And the way I've, I've looked at it is there's a normal curve in society about so many things, about growth. Uh, my wife's a pediatric endocrinologist. You could see short, tall, there's a normal curve for that. And then there's the extremes. And I think what we have felt that we were addressing the entire population of seniors, the entire population of teens and college students and community college students, since we're working with them. And that what we're trying to do is build resilience across of that, across that entire spectrum. But I think the issue of of mental health and mental well-being couldn't be more important to society. And you're right, it's stigmatized and it should not be. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So when you talk about this, um, the stigma on mental health, it's always sort of people are looking for an issue to solve, right? And really it's, we're human. We feel those feelings. Some of us just have a hard time dealing with those feelings. And when we take the shame out of it and we remember people who are experiencing depression as a person who is feeling this, and um, we, we try to, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little mixed up. Um, we take the shame away from that right? Instead of being like, you have these mental health issues, let's find a cure for it. Let's find a solution for that. Instead of, instead of finding a place of belonging for them, where it's okay to feel this, let's just work on how to cope with them um, in the right way, in a safe way. Um, and that that mental health stigma where it's like you have these issues and you're doing this and because of this it's like let's take that shame away a little bit right mm -hmm. some of us are just better at dealing with it um and when we again like I said when we take that shame out of it it gives us a a sort of power to to handle that it gives us power over our feelings and like I said it's um, the emotional literacy behind it is recognizing it and um, being able to name it. And um, I don't want to say the word fix, but deal with it, right? 
And when we talk about it again, we take shame away from it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Raquel, I wanted to stay with you as uh, and turn it over to you to invite two of your amazing, I believe Julia and Rebecca are the ones next oh, to yes. you. Why don't I let you introduce them and and we'll dive into a conversation about yes, I want them to the scene. So this is Grandma Julia. She's my grandma. She has been a foster grandparent program for about 13 years. Going on 14. Going on 14. And she has a experience of being a nurse, um, having the passion to work with young adults. She's actually a current foster grandparent program, um, foster grandparent volunteer here. here at the youth build. And then this is Rebecca. She is a stay-at-home mom of three. And she has been a volunteer with foster grandparents, not as a, not as a grandma. <laughs> so she just has always volunteered with meetings and events and things like that. And she's part of the community. And so she liked to, um, I offered, I offered it to her. I said, Hey, we're doing this cool project. I think you would be perfect for it. And she volunteered. <laughs> So, okay, so my questions, actually, I just want to have a conversation with you guys, is um, if you can share with me an experience that you have seen um, the impact of the lessons, because you guys meet up together, you guys create lesson plans based off of the 87 emotions. Um, so if you want to talk about that a little bit, Reba. Yes. Um, I wanted to share the first lesson that we got into. And, um, you know, me and Grandma Julia got together and came up with a, a lesson plan. Pretty much we talk about um, places we go when things are uncertain or too much. And on this lesson plan, it was stress overwhelm, anxiety, worry, avoidance, excitement, dread, fear, and vulnerability. So we wanted to work on something that um, gave them the definitions and to identify them and also a coping skill um, to come along with it. So in our first lesson plan, we wanted them to express themselves through art. So we had given them paint and canvases and there was one student and this was this was when I knew that we had did something really great in this um, lesson. We had given the students um, the freedom to express themselves through art and there was a young man that um, I want to say like a month or two ago had had lost his mother. And he, um, I want to show you the art, the art that he did. So this is it. And so at the end, when they were done, they had to talk about why they drew what they drew or painted what they painted. And he said, you know, on this side, you know, his life is just ever since he lost his mom, his life is just dark and black. But on this side, he's still trying to hold on to life. And that was most of our goal. That was our goal in the lesson plan to give them room to talk about their feelings, to give them a safe place, um, to express themselves however they would like, because that's what we, we are there for. Um, basically learning from each other. Um, you know, I'm I'm a millennial, you know, grandma's um silent. I, silent. <laughs> Is it a silent generation? And you know, we're working with um. I think they're Gen Z's. They're Gen mm -hmm. Z's or they're much younger. And it was nice because it's like I'm learning from them and they were more than willing to express themselves and mm -hmm. and have that room and feel comfortable enough to talk about that. And that's something that, you know, um, is very, what's the word? But I don't want to say a secret, but very emotional, something that some some want to talk about and some don't. And and there were I have a couple more stories, but that's just one that really stood out. So when you I 
you started talking about co-generating with grandma and the difference between the generations. Mm -hmm. I wonder what have grandma, have you learned working with, um, in a co-generate team? I learned working within a co-generate team that we work together. We learn from each other. Mm -hmm. When she needs help, I help her. And she also do the same for me. Mm -hmm. So working with, like you say, I'm a silent generation <laughs> from 1925 to 1940 something. <laughs> so we're silent. <laughs> I just don't think you like what it's called. I do not. <laughs> So I feel working, I learn from you and from the young adults that we're being with here. It's a lot because like you said, the mental problem that's going on, it's not just mental, there's more to it than that. Mm -hmm. So by working together, we learn so much from each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will continue to learn working mm -hmm. with the younger generation, even though I'm silent. <laughs> It's okay, Grandma. You are definitely not silent. <laughs> um, so when we talk about connecting and working together in a different co-generate team or with co-generate team, um, how do the teams, we meet up every Friday with the teams also from Boys and Girls Club. How do you see the teams connecting with each other? And that can be either uh, right now or in the future. No, now. either you oh, or now. grandma to oh. answer the question. Okay, right now, me and grandma, we work together awesome. I've said this before, but she brings a certain spunk. And she just has a different eye, this different view that I wouldn't know unless she brought it up. She's very encouraging. She pushes you to do better and do the best. Because sometimes I get vulnerable and sometimes I'm like maybe we should do it maybe not and she's like no let's do it <laughs> they're gonna like it let's do it and that's just the push that's the push that's we the feed push. we feed Same. off of each yeah. other mm -hmm. we do we feed because I learned it remind you remind me of me a lot <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> if you don't you know because that's communication is very important yes mm -hmm. to work together mm -hmm even though there's an age difference there. So it's all the same. So we should work with the young adults and work with them. Just all we can do is work with them. What was, I'm sorry, grandma. Oh, go ahead. What has helped you guys sort of build that communication with each other? Um, because communication. <laughs> I think meeting, meeting with each other, meeting, coming together, mm -hmm. talking with each other, um, you know, especially every Fridays. I love it. It gets me out of the house. You know, like I said, I have three boys and it's just, I'm a stay at home mom. So most of my focus is just on them, but this gives me a chance to work with you, mm -hmm. a chance to work, um, you know, with the young adults to give me a different purpose and just to have a different meaning, mm -hmm. you know, the and same like with me, but the other ladies that come mm -hmm. with the uh, younger children mm -hmm. say the kindergartners the first graders what they come and report and with the feedback that I'm getting from them is so helpful and I'm just learning you know I look forward to it every Friday mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. I, yeah I would say there's a lot of vulnerability in our in our team meetings and yes, courage and bravery just yeah. because we we do show up for um as ourselves here yes we do, yeah. And it's, I think it's helped us open up, you it know, has. to each other. And I think that was a way of being able to really build that team because I don't yes. see you guys as like my volunteers. You know, I see you guys as well, part I, of my team. We are, team. <laughs> we are, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Working together. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to lift up a comment that was made in the chat box. Eunice says, such an awesome team. Love the dynamic, the connection, the love and support that's so clear in the relationship, as well as um, Ana Maria saying, I love this so much, so beautiful. You know, I, I think that really captures the essence of the quality of relationship and dare I say friendship around the work that you all are doing <laughs> together. So thank you. <laughs> Those are grandbabies. Yeah. So. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much. Amazing. And also, I wanted to invite, you know, if folks have questions um, for the three of them to please put those in the chat as well. We can certainly return. Uh, moving forward or ahead, I did want to bring in another set of wonderful humans, um, Lewis, uh, who will be leading a conversation with Joe and Ira about this, the SWAN 3G entering. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad I was called a human. Sometimes I'm called a furry Muppet, so I'll take that as a great compliment. Uh, let me introduce Joe first. This is Joe Kitts Clancy, who uh, started off with us when he was a junior uh, at the uh, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia High School of Music and Art in New York City, and then continued as a senior to the next pilot. I don't know why he wanted to come back for more. Maybe he can tell us, and is now uh, pursuing a bachelor's degree at the School of Visual Arts, and he's a comic artist. So thank you, Joe, for joining us. And Ira, who's been my colleague at the workshop for over 16 years, uh, was the editor and editor-in-chief of six different publications and the vice president of the publishing group. Uh, he is one of the co-founders of the uh, 3G program, and he has his own communications company where he consults uh, on with educational media companies both in print and digitally thank you gentlemen for for joining uh, and first kudos to uh, uh, Raquel and your team it was wonderful to hear them so I'm gonna just ask you a couple of questions gentlemen I'm going to start with uh, what do you think was most surprising that you discovered about a yourself B your mentor each other since you were uh, a team and see about your preschooler and i'm going to start with you joe oh well i think for me uh the most surprising time uh was just reconnecting with my childhood um i really didn't expect to like get in touch with it as much as i did i often had a lot of props ira knows uh, that I would be using during these sessions. I had a little robot. Uh, I would sometimes do like paper airplanes and doing those like silly voices and kind of like letting yourself just kind of be in the moment. Uh, I think that helps me. I think that helps like build a lot of confidence in yourself uh, as well. So I think that was a big surprise for me. Um, I also found out how little I knew about the animal kingdom. Uh, little kids can talk your ears off uh about animals all the time um and i think if i had to say something that uh was surprising about my relationship with ira is he was very honest with me uh particularly when it came out to like giving criticisms uh i remember one time um i so one of the kids had said something that was a little bit like surprising or unexpected and I had tried to deviate from that moment with like a joke. And afterward, I was able to kind of confront me and be like, hey, you know, maybe, you know, you don't, you shouldn't deal with humor when it comes to situations like that. And I really appreciated that honesty from him, uh, particularly since we were working in this program together. I feel like uh, a lot of other mentors that I've had in my life haven't been willing to like give me criticism like that. Interesting. Thank you, Joe. Ira. Hi. Well, that's, Wonderful to hear, Joe. Um, you know, one thing I want to say very quickly was that our mentorships, the three of us were in three different places and it was all done virtually, which was very interesting. Um, I found it, I learned and was surprised by um, the ability for all of us to grow. We were creating a relationship, I and Joe and the different preschoolers we worked with over these two summers. Um, and I found that a, a relationship grew really quickly and wonderfully between the three of us. I did not have a direct relationship with the preschooler, but I watched Joe do it. Joe was in working with both of us. Um, one of the things I, that I was surprised by and learned from was the ability to let go. Um, I got to watch, admire, and trust that Joe would be um, able to work through difficulties in his conversation with these preschoolers. I naturally wanted to help, and I would send Joe helpful little notes whenever I thought um, he might use something. And Joe Joe helped me learn because he said to me, you know, those little notes that you're sending me in the chat are a wonderful idea, but they're distracting to me. And I think I'd rather work through it myself. And what was terrific was I then got to see Joe 
take complete charge, stumble at times and be able to pick himself up and continue to talk with the little kid and do wonderful things. So what was thrilling about it was it was a real learning and growing experience for all three of us. Thank you. My next question. Um, what was the role of the segments of the Sesame segments that you found were most important to you? And Joe, did you follow? We created these toolkits with scripts, with with potential questions to ask. My particular uh, uh, student mentee told me they guided him, but he improvised completely and didn't really follow them. How did you feel uh, about those segments? What was your favorite kind of uh, interaction? And, and tell us a little bit about how that worked for you. Um, well, I thought that the Sesame Street segments were really great foundation uh, for the interactions and all of the other uh, student mentors who I've been in feedback sessions with have also agreed with me. I think that it helps like start you off with, you know, thinking of all these ideas and like how to engage with kids. There's some questions that like I wouldn't even think to ask uh, that are there. And I think that the toolkits help kind of read between the lines of some of the videos. Um, and even when kids, because there are some kids uh, in the program who haven't seen Sesame Street, I think that it offers like a doorway, A, to, you know, show them Sesame Street and, you know, see them experience uh, all these puppets for the first time. And it also gives you an opportunity to find out, you know, what shows do they like and get them talking about themselves. Because if you can get a kid, you know, talk to, to talk about themselves, you know, a lot of adults don't, you know, listen to kids sometimes. And if you can prove that you're a good listener, you can prove that you're a good friend. Ira, same question to you. Right. Well, the, the wonderful thing, you know, these were two minute long excerpts from mostly um, songs and music, you know, music and dancing and everything else with the Muppets. Um, what the segments did was, first of all, you, you introduce yourself to the child, Joe did, and then you put on this thing that brought fun and joy and humor immediately into the relationship. Um, and I thought, and without any effort, there was no straining. And um, that was just a wonderful thing. It created a sense of playfulness that the kids picked up on. They could be silly, they could have fun. And it all, in addition to that joyful, wonderful stuff, the segments also were about specific topics, whether it was learning to um, wait until something is done, persisting when you don't feel like you're succeeding. And those conversations work with the little kids. And they also gave Joe and me an opportunity to explore our own personal stories. Thank you. My last question, because I'm sure I'm going to run out of time in a second, is a really hard one, and I don't think I could answer it, but maybe you two can. And that is, given the recent uh, CDC report about hopelessness, a sense of isolation, uh, a sense of depression that is unfortunately so common to teens, especially to teen girls, what do you think a program like ours can really do in creating protective mechanisms and in, in building relationships? Do you think we could do more or what do you think we could do? Ira, I'll, I'll let you go first. Joe, you think. Okay. Um, I, th I think one of the things that was surprising to me was the discovery that all of us seniors made that empowerment was at the heart of this program and that teen empowerment was what it was about. And I think when we when when you have the three generations working together, but the teen is in the middle, getting advice and and thoughts from the older generation, and then given the opportunity and being trusted to interact with the youngers, it just I just saw how it built incredible confidence and um, learning. I just you know I, I I found that it was thrilling for me to watch Joe work through these things to come up with puppets and so on and make funny voices and he but he. So I thought in, in addressing the way young people struggle today, giving them both the faith and the trust in, letting, in, in working with an older person and then showing them that they can work it out themselves, I just thought was a real contribution that could, could help our society. Thank you. Joe. Yeah, I just wanted to add, add on to that. I feel like that there's definitely a crisis of confidence uh, among a lot of people my age because uh, we don't have that many opportunities to build all of those like good social muscles. And I feel like that this helped me develop uh, like a leadership style. So that way I could take charge in social situations and like, you know, bring out like the best in other people and like really start conversations. 
And I think that everyone has the capacity to be a leader in some way or another. And I think that this does a really good job of exposing this potential. And I know that there have been talks of getting uh, some of the student mentors to, you know, to inter interact with one another and like discuss how their feedback sessions would go. And I feel like that's, you know, taking it to the next level because now you can theoretically make friends uh, with other student mentors. And I have friends who have, who have friends that live in like other states. And I feel like that's a great way to get people my age to socialize with one another. Perfect. Thank you so much. The last thing I wanted to say is that because we come from a Sesame, one of the things when we first thought about this is that we would think about the four C's. Uh, you mentioned confidence, that's one. Creativity that you've shown was the second. The third was communications that we were building. And the fourth is community, that we were building a community across generations. And I thank you for participating and onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis, Joe, Ira, confidence, creativity, communications, and community. Thank you. Um, I love the quote that Sandra mentioned in the chat of you are eradicating ageism in the process for future generations too, changing that narrative. Bravo. And, and thank you. So thank you. Um, well, we're going to spend the remaining time in a broader Q&A and just welcome people to continue throwing in their questions and excited to um, come together and, and address as many of those as we can. And thanks to all who already responded. Maybe the first question that I'll put out there um, from one of our participants, Karen. Karen is curious, what is the criteria for choosing program participants? What is the, what is the criteria for choosing program participants? Um, Raquel, can I pass to you and, and then Lewis? Um, yeah, so choosing participants was for foster grandparents. So this was offered to the foster grandparent programs for seniors um, to participate in GST. And if they were interested in it, they would, <laughs> they met the criteria pretty much. And um, if they were open to it and their schedule um, fit with it, then, you know, we obviously um, and let them join in. Um, we didn't want to, um, sort of deem anybody from not participating. As long as you were a foster grandparent program, um, this opportunity was, was, um, introduced to you. And with my younger volunteers, I wanted to focus on, um, Fresno State or actually college students, because I know, um, they need internship hours. I know sometimes they need hours for um, their school or their class. So I thought it would be a great um, opportunity to offer it to them. Um, so we started off with a, a pool of 1800 Sesame alumni and opened it up and we chose Sesame alumni for our seniors. Uh, we chose for teens, a group of young people who worked uh, with the Riley's Way Foundation in New York that had both public and private school participants. Um, and for preschools, we had the West Side Montessori School in Manhattan and five children aid society preschools in New York City. And that was our pool. But when we started thinking about this, we said this should be open to any senior because you don't have to know Sesame Street's curriculum and come from the education side or the production side or the editing side. You just have to go through some training and same with the teens. They have to go through some training so they can understand. And we all went through a criminal background check to make sure that we were safe. Um, and we did this virtually. That was important for us. Thanks so much. That's, that's really helpful. We have another question um, from Amy. I have a foster care grandparent program. Awesome. How do you include three generations in your goals? And this feels like a broader question as well around metrics and measurements and how you are orienting towards goals. Lewis, would you like to get us started and can ah, to Okay. So we 
we des- I used to work in the education department before I became an executive producer. And one of the things we insisted on was doing pretests uh, and post-session uh, uh, tests and uh, a f- formal post-pilot test to see how well we were achieving a sense of communications, con- uh, uh, connection, uh, relationship building, a sense that of uh, empowerment. So we asked questions along those lines and looked at the pre and post, but we had small samples. The first time we had 21 triads. Now we're working with community college students in Los Angeles and the Los Angeles mayor's office. We're going to be doing very small numbers, but we're beginning to build with a, a postdoc at Stanford, a sense of the metrics that we're going to use when we scale this up. We haven't scaled up yet. We still have to work out the technology, but that's the way we will proceed in the future. Um, so I'm still in the beginning phase <laughs> of developing a post and or a pretest and a post test. And what we're working on right now is the connections being felt between the co-generate and co-generate team and then um, with the young adults and the children as well, what it meant to them um, for each lesson as well as what impact would this has this been on for you. Um, but we, we just have, I mean, again, like I said, it's the beginning of our our um, project. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is a question for everybody, uh, whomever would like to respond to this, really curious about, you know, I think we're hearing a lot about what goes really well and just how important a model like this is. And imagine that there may also be some challenges, challenges and growth pains in communication, multi-generational things, and just would love to hear, you know, what are some of the challenges that you face and how are you moving through that? Lewis, you have a knowing smile on your, okay, Raquel, over to you, Raquel. There there are so many, there are so many. (laughs) Look, you know, first, there's a certain amount of hubris you feel saying, can you create a project uh, out of nothing and kind of build it? And my my colleague Iris said, it's like the Mickey Mouse Club to mix metaphors with Sesame Street, uh, trying to ascend, you know, Mount Everest. And that is in some ways we felt, but the idea seemed so powerful to us, so, so simple actually doing it is so much more complicated but it it i think our sense that the joy we found uh, in my and working with uh, henry who is my my team uh, ira and and joe working with each other uh get and and the sense of just this face of the preschoolers we worked with my, our, henry's preschooler said to henry you're my best friend you're my new best friend aren't you and that was after three sessions. And so we felt we're onto something. So all of the seemingly unsurmountable hurdles of how are we ever going to get funded? Uh, how do we do this with such a small team? Uh, Ira has to make a living. How can he do give us so much time? And all of those are, are issues that we have to deal with. But I think we feel that we're onto something. So we keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So um for us, or for me, it, I had never had any experience of beginning a new project, beginning a new program. And, you know, I just, I doubted myself a lot. You know, it's, I need background checks. I need this and I need that. I need people to approve certain things. And it was just, I, it was crazy for me. And I think what helped me the most was that Although sometimes I wouldn't know what the lesson or the team, the team meeting would be about, I didn't have an agenda. They were still there every single Friday, showing up, ready to learn. And um, that, that gave me a sense of hope that, you know, I can do this because I have them um, right beside me. And um, they were so eager to learn and it, it pushed me to, to do this. And, um, but yeah, the whole creating a new project, it's something different, you know, it's, it's hard. (laughs) So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Welcome any other participants too, if you all have, have thoughts on that. Oh, yeah. 
Um, okay, I think the probably the only challenge that I feel like I had was, uh, yes, we had the book, the Brene Brown book, but it was really building a curriculum, basically from nothing, from scratch. <laughs> it's like, that's your class, you guys go. And <laughs> I've never done anything like that before. Yeah. And it was really putting me out of my comfort zone. But I'm really glad that, that I did it because it showed me that I can do it. Mm -hmm. And the responses from the students was just incredible. Um, I was afraid of their response of I was just going to be like a deer in headlights up there and I'm not going to get no response and what's going to happen. And they responded so well, I think better than I than I thought. Yeah. And that was the really much the re, the rewarding part. But it was just the hard part was just building that curriculum. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're still doing it lesson by lesson. But, you know, thank God for, you know, my grandma and Raquel that really pushes me to keep going and just getting out of my comfort zone and just getting in there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We are getting a lot of questions in the chat. So I, I we're going to try to do as many as we can before the end of the hour. Um, we have a question about, for many questions about many people interested in joining in on these efforts or curious about how to get started, um, what to consider. And so would love for you both to speak to the beginning stages and any recommendations, best practices you would offer for folks interested in joining your work and or starting their own. Lewis, perhaps we'll turn okay. to you. I Frankly, I don't know how to really answer that, except to say we've just started. We would love to make this a national and global movement. We just think that, that there are seniors everywhere. There are students everywhere. There are preschoolers everywhere. And if we could come up with the right formula of making it easy and creating, if, if you do it on Zoom, which we had to do uh, for a while, that we have the right technology so you don't you don't need uh one conductor to create uh 100 different breakout rooms on zoom so we are working with a group uh that i think worked with cogenerate called big and mini in texas with their technology we're working with my colleague who is a, a co-generation fellow in los angeles uh who is working with retired teachers community college students interested in early childhood education and the los angeles preschool centers uh, to actually have students go in live. So we're moving from virtual to live. So I think there are many ways to do to do this. And uh, I hope people stay tuned. Uh, you could write to us at, uh, I guess it's 3G program uh, at gmail.com. And we will be happy to keep you informed as soon as we could roll this out a little bit further. We'd love for people to help and join. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so for on this side, I would say, um, focus on, on exactly what purpose and impact you want to make, um, for who, who you work with for us on getting our sites was a little bit easier because we are part of a foster grandparent program who do, who, where we do have volunteers at youth build and we have volunteers at boys and girls club. So we had already had that connection with them and, um, that on that part was 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 easier for us because you know the connection we built and and they love us they love the volunteers so they were all for having the G GST team there um and I would also say um for, for based off of what we're building here um and the curriculum that we're building here you have to have you had to build an environment on your own to get started. Um, I believe that if you have connection with yourself, you have connection with your employees or your staff, um, building that connection around you, you can also build that with your peers, creating a team of connection. Then you can really create um, connection with your community. Um, and to have that getting started, you know, it's already in place here with you and your team or your coworkers and things like that. That's where it all starts. 
Um, and then you can build that foundation of the emotions and teaching that to other people, teaching that to your team, different generations, and then building something together. Um, I would say that it's, um, let's say if a foster grandparent program were to want to take on this program, um, they obviously can get in contact with me, but, <laughs> but you know, the, the teamwork, you, you got to create a team you know, willing to support you and, and um, have the same uh, sort of purpose and passion to do that. Thank you so much. And I see that we are almost at, at time. And I just wanted to end with one final quick question, being it, it really feels like there's so much momentum and interest around this three gen approach. And so as we close out Lewis and Raquel, you know, in addition to Lewis, thank you for sharing your email and just the encouragement to continue learning about these models. Um, wondering if you could share one piece of advice or one place to begin to enter or continue in these conversations around this three-gen approach, what would you recommend for people to do or to participate in to continue this learning and collaborative journey? I would say start with your family or with people who you don't know well, friends of your family, because sometimes your family won't even talk to you. Your teen, your teenage grandchildren, my teen, I'm speaking personally, are too busy, but this... Henry was the son of one of our Sesame alumni. And our, what, what my colleague from Sesame Street said was, you'll never get him to talk. He's so shy. He's so quiet. And he opened up like a flower. And he found that he found this way to open up the preschooler that, that he didn't expect. So try something. And you don't have to use Sesame Street. You can use a book. You can use anything to generate the spark of conversation and theme with each other. And, and I think, uh, as somebody said, being honest and being, being authentic is really the key. And people respond to that really well. Thank you. Um, I would say... For us, for it to continue and to create a bigger impact on our community and hopefully just worldwide, um, you know, it's it's a sim it it's simple. You know, it's hard, but it's simple. And I would say just we've implemented um, with Boys and Girls Club. We've implemented it with Youth Build, and I would say that you know, just some more funding. <laughs> <laughs> some more funding to get this going you know again I'm in, in the beginning of the of the project and we're seeing how it goes and it's been wonderful and I can see the impact that it's happening not only with children and the um, youth and young adults but as three generations in one um, and I and it's it's so possible to to continue this with possibly other foster grandparent programs, um, school-based, um, just based off of this curriculum is what, what is needed really um, to create a sense of belonging for everybody. Um, and that, again, I, it's a simple question. It's a simple answer. Continue with funding. So... <laughs> Family and funding. Well, thank you both and all so, so much for this conversation. We learned so much. And Michelle, passing it back over to you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And I just wanted to give a really big thank you out to Serena for our gracious host, making this such a wonderful program, along with Lewis and Raquel as wonderful participants. And thank you again, big time, to Grandma Julia and Ira. Thank and you. Joseph. I'm Rebecca. So thank all of you for that. And we will be sending out a follow-up letter with the Zoom recording and some contact information um, for the programs. And you can look for that. And we hope you will share this webinar recording out wide with your communities. So thank you all again for coming and thank you for your time and letting us go a little bit over. Um, we could have gone like two hours with this such a great topic yeah. and so much to cover with our participants. So thanks again. And hopefully we'll see you next month at our another webinar.